Today at the National Press Club, the outgoing chairman of the Productivity Commission, Michael Brennan. He'll reflect on his five years leading the organisation and the challenges associated with closing the gap of life outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Michael Brennan, today at the National Press Club. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club and the Westpac Address, coming to you from Ngunnawal and Nambryland, Canberra. My name is Laura Tingle, I'm the club's president. Productivity is back at the centre of the political debate, if it ever went away. Tomorrow, Treasurer Jim Chalmers will release the latest intergenerational report here at the club, and like many treasurers before him, he has his own view about what the important productivity issues are for the times. But our guest today has much to say about productivity and public policy as he comes towards the end of his term as Chair of the Productivity Commission and brings long experience as a Treasury and Finance official and as a Ministerial staffer to the broader public debate. The Commission's work has expanded and diversified significantly since the days when it simply focused on measuring industry assistance. Some of its most significant work now relates to putting real measurements on the gaps in service provision faced by Indigenous communities, an issue which the referendum on an Indigenous voice is keen to fix. Please welcome Michael Brennan to address us today. Well, thank you, Laura. It is a great privilege to be asked here to the National uh, Press Club uh, as the shadows lengthen as I come towards the end of my five-year term as Chair of the Productivity Commission. I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional custodians of this land, and I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution to the life of this region and city. As I come to the end of my term, it seems like uh, there's a lot of talk of productivity, a little less of the thing itself. But today I wanted to give you some reflections on the broad nature of economic progress, touching on our work on productivity, but also touching on our work in respect of the Closing the Gap Agreement. So I want to start with a question. How many minutes does it take to make a loaf of bread? Of course, it's a trick question, just in case your mind had turned to how long you'd spend kneading the dough or baking it in the oven. <clears throat> in fact, the answer is, for the average person in Australia today, about four minutes. And it's four minutes because that is the amount of time required by someone working at today's average wage to have enough money to purchase a standard loaf. It is a measure of how effective our economy has become at bread making. And by bread making, I don't just mean the process of kneading and baking the dough, I mean the whole bit. It's ploughing the fields, sowing the seeds, building the fences, harvesting the wheat, milling it, producing the yeast, even mining and manufacturing the oven. All of that for four minutes of work, doing whatever it is that an individual worker does best. They can effectively command all those resources, have all of those processes coordinated on their behalf. Now, in contrast, in 1901, it took 18 minutes of the average worker's time to purchase a loaf of bread. Back then, agriculture employed 25% of the Australian workforce. Today, it's around 5%. But wheat production's gone from 1 million tonnes to 25 million tonnes. So each tonne of wheat is produced with less land and vastly less labour. And that is a story of replacing human labour with machinery, the horses with tractors, and the application of all sorts of science, crop types, pesticides, fertilisers, etc. And that combined with the similar productivity growth that occurred in the manufacturing industry, in the transport industry over the course of the 20th century, is all there baked into the humble loaf of bread. And that is productivity. And that story of reduced real cost measured in the labour of the average worker and the time taken uh, to afford various things has been very much the pattern of productivity growth over the last century. 
And I start with that example in part because of a worry that for many people today, the whole concept of productivity and its practical application has become a bit abstract, maybe not all that practically relevant. As recently as the 1950s, half of our workforce was employed in manufacturing, mining, agriculture, all sectors which, in which for both workers and managers, the concept of productivity is pretty intuitive. Today, 90% of the workforce is in services. So what does productivity really mean for someone working in health or disability or aged care or finance? So the bread example does at least help to highlight the link between productivity and real wages. Over the medium term, productivity growth means each hour of work goes further, can allow you to purchase more things. But the other thing that's good about that example is it, it does get you thinking about how not everything is exactly like that. There are a lot of goods and services that have become cheaper, but there are a lot that haven't. But they've gotten a lot better. So you take health. So how many minutes of the average worker's time would it take to visit a GP in 1901 versus today? Well, the answer is it's unlikely to be a lot of change because whatever the relativity is between the GP's wage and the average worker's is going to be reflected. If it's twice, then it's going to take an hour of the average worker's time to see the GP for half an hour. That's true whether you're doing it in 1901 or whether you do it today. So no visible cost reduction in that service, unlike the loaf of bread. What has changed? is the quality. The doctor's ability to understand, to diagnose, to prescribe has been transformed by medical advance and that's made us vastly better off, it's lengthened lives and it's made them more satisfying. It hasn't reduced the cost of medicine, quite the contrary. And that's true for many services, partly because of the very significant labour content that's embedded in the product. It's proven very hard to replace, proven very hard to automate, at least until now. And then there's a leisure dimension, because after all, if the average worker today is spending 14 minutes less working to afford that loaf of bread, well, that's 14 more minutes uh, to work towards something else, like a smartphone or a holiday, but it's also maybe an opportunity to work a bit less. And in fact, average hours of work in Australia have fallen by around 30% or 13 hours of a week uh, since 1900, though notably the participation rate, the proportion of the adult population in the workforce has risen substantially over that time. These are all forms of economic progress, broadly conceived. Not all of them are officially counted in our statistics, but they all matter. And when we were working on our five-year productivity review released in March this year, one of my constant admonitions was we had to talk less about the macro aggregates, like GDP per hour worked, like capital deepening and multi-factor productivity, and more about these concrete instances of productivity growth, what it really means in detail and how it comes about and how it differs in specific cases. That's partly because GDP is an imperfect measure of living standards, but it's also because an understanding of that quality dimension might be more important in a services-dominated economy, just as the real cost reductions ruled the goods sector of the 20th century. And it's important to realise, going forward, we're going to need both. The other challenge is that talking about a smooth overall annual productivity growth rate can obscure a bigger reality. Productivity growth is not smooth. It's rarely evenly distributed and it's never predictable. There is, for example, the remarkable fact that pretty much all of the improvement in living standards over the last 10,000 years of human history took place in roughly the last 200, the period since the early 1800s, in the proverbial blink of an eye in historical terms and only in certain countries, something about which economists have been remarkably incurious. And it's lumpy and it's uneven. Productivity growth always consists of a series of technological waves, new technologies, new business innovations that come along. They're almost always characterised by that S-curve shape. The take-up of a new invention starts slowly and then it accelerates rapidly and then eventually it plateaus. So as one example I'll give you is the motor car. So <clears throat> in 1900, the average Australian travelled 2,500 kilometres per year roughly 40% of that by mass transit, 
40%, walking and cycling about 20% uh, by horse. Rise of the motor car followed that S curve. Started slowly, then it accelerated rapidly in the years post the Second World War. By the 1990s, it had replaced all but 15% of all other modes of land transport. More to the point, over that period, the average Australian went from travelling 2,500 kilometres per year to travelling over 13,000 kilometres per year. So what happened is the car unleashed a revolution in mobility. It spawned new suburbs, it factories on the urban fringe, the big cost reductions in freight and logistics with a big productivity dividend attached. <clears throat> and then, in the last 20 years, it just plateaued. We're no more mobile today than we were in the late 1990s. <clears throat> and the cost of moving people and goods around stopped falling. Urban congestion's gotten worse. So the quest now turns to new sources of productivity, new sources of cost reduction and supply side growth. And as it happens, the cost of moving information has fallen dramatically in the last 30 years, which spawns new models like online commerce, like telehealth, like remote work. And congestion on our roads and public transport can, if we are prepared to grasp the opportunity, be addressed in part through technology-enabled real-time information, also pricing models, which were not available to us in the days of the fuel excise or, or paper tickets. The point is, a successful economy is one that catches those successive waves that can be moved from one transformational source of productivity growth to the next. One that might look and feel a bit different, one which might call forth different policy responses. But it's a story about adaptability, it's a story about dynamism. And that is what we're trying to get at when we talk about productivity policy. Now we know that it's getting harder. The last decade, as is now well known, uh, has seen the slowest productivity growth in 60 years. As it turns out, that's a fairly common phenomenon across the developed world. Whatever the reason, for as a society, we've been slower at generating new ideas, slower at diffusing them across the economy uh, about how to produce goods and services that are newer, better, or hitherto unimagined. Now, admittedly, the technological inventions from the late 19th century through to the middle of the 20th century were a pretty hard act to follow. As the American economist Robert Gordon put it, those inventions replaced the unremitting daily grind of painful manual labour and household drudgery, darkness, isolation and early death with safer jobs in air-conditioned environments, electric appliances which could perform household tasks, electric light at the flick of a switch, and isolation replaced by the telephone, the colour TV, fast travel, and of course average life expectancy, which went from about 45 to over 70. Those changes were truly miraculous for the people who lived through them, but they can only happen once. The question for us is not whether we can replicate the pace of that transformation. The question is, what is it that we need to do in order to give ourselves the best possible chance of continued rising living standards into the future. My view is that it requires that we have maximum adaptive capacity. And to do that, we need a lot of things. We raised 70 of them across 1,000 pages, as many of you know, back in March. But today, I just want to focus on three. One is improved human capital. One is a bit of a shift in the emphasis of the innovation debate. And finally, the question of entrepreneurship and innovation within government itself. On education, it's worth noting that people spend longer in formal education today than at ever, in any point in human history. Now, in the past, sectors like agriculture and manufacturing provided high-paying jobs to people with relatively low levels of formal educational qualification. The services sector, which now dominates, is a bit less forgiving. Because when labour makes up the bulk of the value being transacted, the quality of that labour really matters. And we've derived a lot of productivity gains in the past from higher levels of educational attainment, like more years spent at school, 
and those benefits are still flowing through. But like everything else, they too plateau. They get to the top of the S-curve and they start to level off. There are just limits to the future gains that we can make by having young people spend more years in formal education. We have to achieve a quality dividend. That is to say, a productivity improvement in the educational sector itself, including for, you know, getting more and better out of the inputs that we put in, including the years of a student's life. And despite a lot of economic change over the last 70 years, I think it is fair to say that the basic models of education have not really changed that much over that period. So our challenge is to achieve the sort of transformation in education that we achieved in, say, medicine and health over the last 150 years. If you just think for a moment about even the modest, the downgraded rate of productivity growth likely in the IGR tomorrow, 1.2%, what would that mean in the education sector? Well, that would imply that we could basically offer uh, the same number of students, teach them to roughly the same standard in 20 years with about 22% of 22% uh, reduction in the existing workforce. That would be the real cost reduction route, like the loaf of bread, or there's the quality route. We could have a similar workforce, but student outcomes lifting by about 25% over the next couple of decades. Now, that's a hard thing to measure, but at the very least, it would imply a big improvement in, in PISA, in NAPLAN, big improvement in every student's readiness to embrace further study as they leave school. Now, one sort of potential gain might come from a better understanding of cognitive science. Maybe there'll be a stronger link between the science of learning and everyday classroom practice. We could be on the cusp of big technological transformation in education, both digital communications to expand access to the best possible teaching and instruction, but also AI uh, to provide real-time assessment and guidance to teachers and students as to where additional effort could be focused. That would augment the role of teachers, not replace it. But we have to be prepared to embrace that change. Other countries almost certainly will, particularly those that have traditionally lacked access to quality teaching. And they'll see technology as their big chance to catch up, to leapfrog even, uh, developed economies in terms of their human capital development. We'll also need a renewed focus on lifelong learning because the current model focuses very much the significant public subsidy on that initial acquisition of skills post-school. But increasingly, <clears throat> but we haven't subsidised particularly uh, that learning that takes place mid-career, beyond the, the initial acquisition of skills. Now we're seeing the rise of short-form credentials, micro-credentials, and that suggests the emergence of a greater culture, a greater appetite for lifelong learning. Just by way of one example, our work suggests that levels of management capability could be a factor that is holding back overall firm performance and productivity in Australia. A more nimble system of lifelong education might be part of what's required and the recognition of qualifications to encourage mobility of labour across jobs and firms. That's an important channel by which new ideas spread across the economy. That brings us to innovation. You know, we often think of innovation policy in terms of stimulating new research and cutting edge invention. The traditional policy tools like the R&D tax incentive or intellectual property settings, the commercialisation of university research, to name just a few. These are important levers, but there is a forgotten side to innovation policy. And it's namely the question of diffusion. How is it that a new technology and new business innovations spread across firms in the economy? Because 98% of Australian firms are not new to the world inventors. They're adopters, they're adapters, they're tinkerers with existing technology. And lifting the performance of those firms is the main game in productivity policy. You know, in agriculture, we had extension services to get out and spread the benefits of public, publicly funded R&D out to the farmers. I don't think we've really addressed the question of what the innovation ecosystem looks like in a service-dominated economy. Now, our report back in March made a start, but I think we have to keep developing our thinking on that issue. Now, the role for government isn't always straightforward, but there is some role. Clearly, the public sector's appetite for technology 
is a big driver, potentially, of take-up for small and medium enterprises. Arguably, the most effective diffuser of knowledge is a dynamic and competitive economy. Those evolutionary forces by which good ideas are rewarded, by which resources flow to more productive firms, that's what drives the economy forward. It's what drives us forward to higher levels of prosperity. Only two weeks ago, The Economist magazine pointed out that the pace of diffusion in new technology across firms seems to be slowing across the developed world. And of course, it's not just the technology that matters. One lesson we can garner from history is that the biggest productivity gains don't just come from the simple adoption of technology, they come from the complementary business innovations that sit around it. That was the story of electricity, uh, which was invented in the 1870s, but took until the mid 20th century, uh, yeah, 1870s to, to about the mid 20th century, to really be fully driven through United States manufacturing. Because the gains didn't come from the mere replacement of a steam-based source of power with a single electric motor. They came from the re-engineering of the, the whole production line to take advantage of the fact that you could now have multiple uh, uh, machines powered by electricity at different points in the production line rather than the single steam-based uh, motor. So technology is important, but often it's the new business model. It's the Uber, it's the Netflix. That's what drives the big gains. So we need regulatory systems that look kindly on new business models. We need a tax system that promotes new firm entry. We also need to think a bit about policies that could help promote a healthy risk appetite among investors and would-be entrepreneurs. That brings me to the non-market sector, those services that are mainly funded and delivered by government in areas like health, education, community services, aged care, disability. Areas where we've arguably settled on some very labour intensive models, where innovation is not always encouraged, where the diffusion of good ideas is not necessarily always easy. But they are a big and growing share of the economy, too big to be exempt from potential future productivity gains. But, but what could these look like? In some cases, it's just about finding the lowest cost setting for service delivery. It's healthcare in the community or aged care in the home or finding some alternatives to costly incarceration. But also technologies like AI, digital communications, robotics could also play a role, but their effectiveness will be blunted if we have rigid rules that hamper their uptake. Again, it's as much the business model as it is the technology itself. You think of health, a sector with remarkable technological uptake when it comes to medical innovation, blockbuster drugs, diagnostic equipment, surgical procedures, but a complete laggard when it comes to the use of general technology, either to reduce cost or improve quality uh, to service, uh, quality of service to patients and customers. In our work on mental health, we saw the positive impact of moderated online services to improve quality and convenience and reduce costs. But of course, the challenge is that the, the MBS, the Medicare Benefits Schedule, very much enshrines the one-on-one -on -one physical real-time consultation as the staple of the system. And that is effectively a hard barrier to any productivity gain, at least in the form of a real cost reduction. And we have other areas of service delivery that explicitly enshrine staff ratios, for example. Now, if we had staff ratios on the farm or in the factory, we would still be toiling for 18 minutes for our loaf of bread instead of four. And then there's a question as to whether the very structures of government can adapt when needed to deliver better outcomes. And that is the question at the heart of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap. And this is the last area that I wish to cover today. Arguably, nobody sees the limitations and inefficiency of government quite like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The fragmentation, the red tape, the one-size-fits-all approach. And the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, signed in 2020, promised something different. It has two key features. The first, it was explicitly an agreement between all governments, state and federal, and a coalition of peak Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations. The second salient feature is, in addition to setting out the 17 socioeconomic targets, it set out four priority reforms, things governments would commit to, to undertake in order to contribute to the achievement of those outcomes. 
Now, as we speak, only four of the 17 targets set out in the agreement are on track, but it's early. Some others are improving, but the gap isn't narrowing fast enough, but others are going entirely in the wrong direction, like the rate of incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That rate steadily increased over the 10 years prior to the agreement, and it's continued to increase, increase since. And it was never clear what governments felt they were putting in place that would reverse that trend under the agreement. And that's why the priority reforms are so important, so central to this agreement. So the agreement commits governments to establish more formal shared decision-making and partnership between governments and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to strengthen the Aboriginal community-controlled sector, to transform government entities to be more responsive in achieving the outcomes, and to share relevant data. They all sound pretty basic. In fact, they are truly radical because they challenge or re require a move away from the traditional upwards accountability of government in favour of an accountability to the people that policy affects or that services are intended to benefit. It requires a bit of letting go of power and service specifications. Now, as our draft report recently released indicates, the progress against these reforms is, so far, pretty limited. Now, granted, governments are busy. Uh, if you tally up the actions under all of the implementation plans uh, by our nine jurisdictions, you'll come up with 2,000 actions which, purporting, which are purporting in some way to be contributing towards closing the gap. But this busyness is really just business as usual. I mean, governments have taken some tentative steps in the right direction. There are some good examples of positive practice, and they are highlighted in our report. And yes, we are just three COVID-affected years into the life of this agreement. But these priority reforms are not new in substance. They've been talked about. They've been sought by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for many years. And this agreement promised transformation. And that is the ambition against which we are entitled to judge it. Now, most jurisdictions have put in place some formal partnership arrangement, but the feedback we hear as we travel around the country is that that engagement is still often pretty formulaic, a bit tick the box, late, and not altogether transparent as to how it is that it's informing policy decisions. Yes, there is some movement of funding towards the community-controlled sector, but it is largely in what we describe as the lift and shift model, where the contract specifications remain with government agencies, where the ACOs, as we call them, are still left to cobble together multiple small grants, time limited, with a big red tape reporting burden, just to keep the show on the road. It's a far cry from trusting the Aboriginal community-controlled sector uh, and the knowledge that it has. And meanwhile, as I mentioned, decisions continually get made in other areas, like criminal justice, that almost certainly will worsen performance against a closing the gap target. And it's just not clear how the agreement is influencing those deliberations around the cabinet table or within government. All of it leaves the impression that governments have at least not lived up to and perhaps have not really fully understood what it was and the extent of the transformation that they promised and signed up to in 2020. And these issues go to that broader question. Can government change its fundamental business model when that's what's required to deliver better outcomes? Because let's face it, there's any number of complex issues, like the more general issue of entrenched, localised, multifaceted disadvantage where the traditional siloed approach of government service delivery has largely failed to make a dent. Government has to be able to countenance radical options, has to be able to think about devolving responsibility, parting with top-down power, allowing localised entrepreneurship, giving frontline workers a wide remit in terms of how they practically solve problems on the ground. And all of those things run counter to public service culture and system inertia. But if we want continued economic progress, particularly for the most marginalised, we have to be able to face up to that challenge. Now, I see this work as a natural fit for the Productivity Commission, but it's not to say that it has been business as usual for us. For the last four years, we've been on 
a significant journey. We've been doing more and more work in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander policy. And that's pretty new for us, and it has meant change. We've had to embark on that very transformation that Priority Reform 3 of the Closing the Gap Agreement requires of all government entities. It wasn't enough to come to this task simply as the Productivity Commission of old for all of the Productivity Commission's historic strengths. We had to be that, all of that, and something more. So we've had to build our cultural capability. We've had to hire new Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, of whom I'm immensely proud. We've had to cultivate new relationships, build our knowledge base. We've changed our models of engagement to be more reciprocal, less transactional. And we've had to broaden our thinking. And we're not done. But when the Coalition of Peaks agreed in 2020 to embed the role of the Productivity Commission in the Closing the Gap Agreement, they didn't do it on our track record. They did it as an act of faith. And I said to Pat Turner at the time that we would work hard to repay that faith. And nobody's contributed more uh, to that commitment than Robley Mokak, who's here today, our inaugural Indigenous Policy Commissioner, supported by a team effort, also supported by our previous Social Policy Commissioner, Richard Spencer, and our, I say, new, newish Social Policy Committer, Commissioner, N Natalie Siegel Brown, who, of course, uh, presented on our report at GAMA. I just emphasise this as an example of the extent to which the Productivity Commission has continued to evolve over time. On this dimension, we have changed substantially in the last four years. There are other examples, including our work in water policy, in health, disability, aged care, etc. But economic progress means adaptation and it means change. And that evolution within the Productivity Commission will go on. I am very positive about the future of the Productivity Commission. I am very supportive of Chris Barrett's appointment as the new chair. Knowing that the Productivity Commission will continue to bring all of those traditional strengths to new and important areas, just as we've been asked to do on closing the gap. Our capability has to be broad because economic progress is a broad concept, whether it be cheaper bread or better health or closing the gap in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There's a common principle, finding new ways to deliver something better, supporting and rewarding our innovators and spreading that knowledge quickly across the community. How well we do that as an economy, as a federation, as a society, will determine our living standards in the decades to come. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Michael. Um, Lots of really interesting things to pursue, and I'll, I'll try not to be greedy and take them all. Um, but one point, um, you talk about the fact that governments have basically just been doing business as usual, um, and about the Productivity Commission itself having to transform the way it's approached all of the uh, Indigenous issues. Can you tell us what you think it would look like for governments to actually make that transformation you know, uh, and put, put how, you know, if you're a bureaucrat, what, what would you be doing? I mean, would there be things like some sort of system of um, sort of uh, marking up uh, existing Indigenous organisations to give them some uh, sort, of, uh, sort of credibility with bureaucrats so that you could get over that? sort of issue? I mean, what, how would it work? So I think it's a range of things, some of which go to those things which are concrete and identifiable, and Priority Reform 3 actually lists out a number of things that governments are committed to do, to uh, develop cu cultural capability, address institutional racism, etc. So there is some guidance there, uh, and some of it is amenable to those, you know, it is about training and it is about awareness and, and these sorts of things. But it, it can't be just that. There, at the end of the day, there has to be some capacity to kind of look holistically at how is an institution performing? Does it look fundamentally different to what it looks like before? And I can only think about our own example. There are a number of intangible ways in which the sorts of conversations we have around the commission table, among staff, 
not just on projects like Closing the Gap, but of projects across the board, just manifest completely differently to the way they did even four or five years ago. There's an awareness, a sensitivity and tools of engagement, if you like, that, are, that just look different. So I, I think it, it is that combination of observable things, uh, a bit of a sense of the intangible. There does have to be an accountability mechanism. Uh, it's hard for agencies to judge their own performance. I'm judging ours at the moment, but we, you need to be prepared to subject yourself to some external judgment. And the agreement itself does actually enshrine that each jurisdiction will have an independent mechanism by which to judge this transformation of government entities. Now, at the moment, I'm pretty safe in saying, I think, with the possible exception of one jurisdiction, nobody's on track to even meet that, to have established the independent mechanism to do it. So we see that as an important priority. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be that combination. Uh, it, it really is that sense of, it, in the day-to-day -day work that I'm doing, am I conscious of the commitments made under Closing the Gap and how is it that my job actually contributes to those things? But um, if you're... I'm just trying to get into the public service mindset, as you say, you know, they, they want to sort of have upwards accountability. They, they're thinking, oh, Senate estimates, they're going to ask me about this or there might be questions in Parliament and I need to know how the funding has been dispersed. Is there a, a mechanism to get around that so that you do actually say, OK, we think this particular Indigenous organisation is, you know, is completely capable of making these decisions. How do we make that change so that people feel confident to do that? Yeah, I think part of this is taking the longer term view. So I think part of it would be the structure of the contracts themselves. You know, at the moment, as I mentioned, we have uh, a number of very time limited grants, time limited contracts. Uh, when we did our work on family and children's services in the Northern Territory, you found that the median duration of a grant was between two and four years. 40% of them were less than two years and they're all small grants. I just think that has to change. You have to think about the five year, the seven year term. Uh, and it's a more relation, relational arrangement, it's more partnership focused. So rather than thinking, well, we have to front up to Senate estimates or front up to the Auditor General with our clear KPIs and this is what we achieved, there's a, there's a broader KPI, which is that we've invested in a community controlled organisation and we're working in partnership with them to, we, we've trusted them, uh, we, we're with it, we, we're in, the, in it with them for the long term and we're working with them on, on how it is that they're delivering um, for the community that they serve. David Crow has a question. Thanks, Laura. Uh, thanks, Mr Brennan, for your speech. David Crow from the Student Money Held and the Age of Melbourne. Uh, on closing the gap, you've outlined very clearly, I think, uh, the failures in the current approach to getting results. You talked about missed targets. You also said that a lot of the consultation was pretty formulaic. So the current system is really not delivering. Does it then follow that, in your view, the Indigenous voice is a better model, that it actually offers a break with a model that's not working and offers a better solution? So we have no view about whether a constitutionally enshrined voice is the right way to go, the wrong way to go, that is a decision for the Australian people, Australian people to make later in the year, whenever that is. We keep coming back to the fact that this is an agreement that enshrines priority reforms that have been agreed to, right? So these exist uh, as, as commitments from 2020 and they enshrine the commitment to shared decision making, partnership arrangements, etc. That can take a variety of forms. In doing our work, I mean, in one sense, you know, we, we could just leave the referendum altogether, but we knew it was the elephant in the room. We had to kind of talk about it to some extent. We had to talk about it in part because various jurisdictions are going down their own path. There's the prospect of a legislative uh, voice or legislated voice in South Australia. There's treaty and truth-telling processes in other states. All we really say about it is um, those mechanisms, to the extent that they come into being, they can work well within the closing the gap architecture. That might make a lot of sense. But equally, if, if they don't, and if there's not a legislated, or sorry, not a constitutional voice at the federal level, uh, then you need other mechanisms. And the agreement enshrines various mechanisms. By the time of our final report, the referendum will have happened. So we'll, we'll know, uh, ha you know how to go forward on that. I will just make one other observation, which is um, we think that there is a very important role for this agreement. So notwithstanding that 
you know, there are other issues, including the voice that are the subject of a lot of public debate now. The virtue of this agreement is that it has a very strong focus on outcomes. It identifies 17 of them. It has a strict reporting regime. There's strong accountability. There's annual reporting by jurisdictions. There's the three yearly review that we undertake, partnered up with an Indigenous led review. Those things are all important, and there is even some risk that for those jurisdictions that have gone forward with treaty, truth telling, other things, uh, that there's a bit of a sense of we've sort of all moved beyond closing the gap. I think that would be a big mistake. I think there's great importance in maintaining the architecture of that 2020 agreement. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up? The Australian people are watching, you know, this debate, uh, and they really only have one decision. It's a yes or no. The job of the Productivity Commission is to advise governments on the best path forward, in a, in a sense through that to advise the Australian people. So shouldn't the Productivity Commission have a view on the voice? The Australian people only have that yes or no that they can cast a vote on. They can, sure, they can vote for the government at the next election, but that's their only decision. Shouldn't you be able to help them make that decision with some advice on whether the voice is a better way? The role of the Productivity Commission is embedded in the Closing the Gap Agreement. It is to, prov to undertake a review of progress under that agreement, and that's what we've done uh, as for advising the people on their vote in a constitutional referendum. It's not really our bag. Thanks. Joe, Joe Kelly. Uh, Joe Kelly with The Australian, Mr Brennan. Um, you've talked about the need for governments to be more adaptive, change their business model when required to deliver better outcomes. And you talked about education specifically in a transformation in education, a greater focus on quality. We had the NAPLAN results today, and they're very poor. They show that students are now twice as likely to fail than to excel, despite record spending of $72 billion on schools last year. What's going wrong at the moment with the education system, despite these record amounts of money being pumped into the system, we're still not getting the results that we need? How do we fix that? Well, <clears throat> I think to some extent it is some of the things that I've talked about today. Admittedly, some of these things are a bit over the horizon. But when we looked at our report on the National Schools Reform Agreement, uh, which was really to inform all jurisdictions as they think about uh, sort of effectively agreeing a successor compact uh, to that agreement. We looked at a few things. I mean, one of the challenges, I think, in school education in Australia is that we have uh, a national curriculum, which is pretty broad. We have a lot of classroom practice. We have 300,000 teachers, or thereabouts, two to 300,000. Uh, it's a mass profession. We are putting a lot of burden on our teachers to effectively translate this high-level national curriculum into daily lesson plans, and it's probably pretty inefficient, um, both in terms of the use of teachers' time, and, and time and again we see this coming back, uh, the strain on teacher time, the sense that too much time is being taken away from what they do best, which is classroom practice. Uh, and it does seem to us, and it's, as it seemed to many other commentators, that there's probably a role for uh, the new architecture that we've got around the Australian Education uh, Research Organisation, Aero to provide more in the way of detailed, evidence-based support to teachers as to what they can be doing on a, on a daily basis. Uh, so that kind of uh, evidence-based pedagogical advice, um, just basically providing a higher quality classroom experience is, is a critical piece, I think. Um, as to the spending, I mean, look, it, it, it goes to this more general point. I think for too long we have tended to say that uh, certain sectors, including those delivered by government, are kind of exempt from any kind of productivity imperative. Uh, that doesn't apply, doesn't apply to these areas. You just can't translate the loaf of bread into the smarter student. Um, but the challenge is if we maintain that, if we continue to acquiesce in low productivity growth and tolerate it, then uh, we won't see improvement, we won't get the benefit of that human capital uh, formation and these sectors will continue to grow as a share of the workforce and continue potentially to be a drag on economy-wide productivity growth. Michael Reid. Uh, Michael Reid from the Australian Financial Review. Um, the government has effectively ruled out sweeping tax reform like raising the GST or um, lowering personal and company tax rates. 
Uh, to what extent do you think the current tax system is acting on a handbrake on productivity? Look, I think changes to tax will always be a significant lever. Uh, we talked about it a bit in the productivity review. We didn't want to reinvent the Henry report because I think it stands the test of time as the kind of bible on the directions that tax reform ought to go. We did count as a few options that government might have around corporate tax reform, that sort of thing. So yes, tax is important. The tax debate is very important. The one observation, I'll make two observations, uh, Henry notwithstanding, uh, when we've seen successful efforts at tax reform in Australia in the past, most recently in the early 2000s, it had a long build-up and there was a, a lengthy process of intellectual consensus building that led to it. So when you think about the introduction of a broad-based indirect tax, the GST, that really started with the Asprey Review in the 1970s. Uh, had option C uh, in the 1980s, fight back in the early 90s, and eventually, you know, you got, it, it saw the light of day in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And you need that sort of intellectual preparation, that tilling of the soil. Uh, now, I think Henry was a really good example of that, but I think we've got to rebuild a bit of that intellectual consensus about what is it that we're trying to achieve in, in tax reform going forward. The other element that was significant in driving the success of tax reform in the late 90s and early 2000s, you may recall, was a significant stakeholder coalition involving both the business community but also ACOS, who came to the table out of a concern that the revenue base was withering and tax reform was important to shore it up. Uh, and that helped to kind of propel the debate forward. And I just say that because it's sometimes, I think, a little unfair to throw all this back on government and say, well, why aren't you out there leading a debate? Why aren't you out there taking grand political risks? Um, I think we often need to help build a bit of that community consensus so the government can then act on it. Thank you. Melissa Code. Hi, Mr Brennan, Melissa Code from The Mandarin. Um, prior to his appointment as Australian Public Service Commissioner, Gordon de Brouwer was appointed Secretary for Public Sector Reform. And so when I was listening to your speech and reflecting on things like your call for uh, a shift of the way government's fundamental business model operates and also this issue of public service culture and system inertia, I wonder if you can share your reflections with us from a productivity perspective. Why it is or isn't good to sort of reframe uh, the wider public's regard of the public service as more of a public sector ecosystem, which involves more than just the government agencies and institutions and the capability inside that you've been referring to. Um, and maybe also with a reference to your time in the private sector working for PwC. Oh, you had to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think we are in Australia incredibly fortunate to have, and I, this is a health warning, this is a completely self-serving reflection, <laughs> but to have a very high quality public sector. I think the quality of our policy makers, uh, state and federal, is, uh, is very, very strong, right? Whether that's the community view or not, I, I, I couldn't speculate, but that's my experience of it. Um, and I think, to be honest, it's the experience of a lot of senior private sector people when they come into contact with government, particularly in the course of a crisis like the GFC, uh, when senior bankers for the first time you know, dealt with Treasury officials around how we were going to kind of um, you know, rescue the world. Uh, it, it just becomes very evident that you're dealing with some very smart and very well, in, you know, deeply motivated and committed people. Um, and that is the public sector that, that we've got. So we're very fortunate in that respect. You know, how do we change it? I mean, I think a lot of talk has, has gone on over the years about how we build a bit of risk appetite, a bit of preparedness to fail occasionally in the public sector. None of that's easy, because uh, we talk about it and then, you know, at the first whiff of grape shot, there's the tendency to, to batten down the hatches. But that is part of it. I think we have to tolerate a degree of experimentation and failure. Um, and I think, you know, encouraging pr probably greater cross-fertilisation between public and private sectors. I think the public sector has a huge amount to offer. Uh, it's good to get outside diverse views in, and it's good for some of our people in the public sector to, to kind of get out and um, experience the private sector as well. Do you have any sort of high-level views on how that accountability piece you've been talking about works when we become a more hybrid ecosystem? <laughs> 
Oh, I'd have to give it a bit of thought. I mean, I think the accountability mechanisms we have are pretty robust. Um, federally, standard estimates, auditors general, uh, productivity commission reports. You know, we have a lot of institutional architecture that keeps government honest uh, and contributes to a debate that's conducted in the public domain. I think that the fact that we have independent entities, the fact that they have transparent processes, uh, that they put out reports, stimulate debate, I think that's a big part of it, to be honest. Ben Westcott. Hello, Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thank you so much for your speech, much, Michael. Um, Australia is not alone in having a productivity problem. In fact, uh, many countries around the world have got similar issues. Uh, and I know that's the view of some in government as well. Uh, in your view, um, to what extent is our productivity problem something that just is something Western economies are facing? And to what extent is it something that we individually can fix? Well, it clearly is that. I mean, it, it is a remarkably common uh, common affliction across the board. And, and I think that is important to remember because, uh, again, we, we naturally tend to kind of hold governments to account a bit. That's fine. There is a policy element to all this. But we've got to remember, too, there are some aspects and contextual features of this debate that are kind of beyond government's control. That governments can't control the, the global pace of technological development, right? And that is a key driver of rising living standards. Um, Part of the challenge, of course, is uh, it'll surprise you to know economists themselves can't really agree on the root cause of that productivity slowdown. Um, but I think there is a lot in what I described as the Robert Gordon thesis. Um, as much as it's the conceit of every age to believe that a pace of change has never been so rapid, um, it's probably not true uh, in our case. That the sort of change that occurred between the late 19th century and the middle of the 20th um, was very rapid. I mean, the move from candlelight at night to the you know electric light at the flick of a switch, change in life expectancy, the change in human health, uh, all of that. Um, so it is hard to replicate that. Those things only happen once. I guess the the question is, you know, do we have the wherewithal to um, stack the odds in our favour? You know, there's no big lever that we can pull that will automatically see productivity growth return to the sorts of levels we've had uh, in the past. Um, but I think we, you know, there are technologies out there now that if we were using them more to the full, um, we could extract some significant gains. I think it's partly about looking in the right places. Um, I suspect we have neglected the non-market sector for too long because we've kind of exempted it. Um, we've not necessarily been alive. I've mentioned health, but a lot of these service areas where we just haven't been prepared to fully utilise what even information technology is, you know, the dividend that can come potentially from that. Thanks very much. Peter Martin. Uh, Peter Martin from The Conversation, Michael. I want to return to the voice and an aspect of the voice you can help us with. The voice is in the Constitution, or it will be if we put it in the Constitution, it'll specify the institution. There's already an institution in the Constitution. It's in Section 101. It's the Interstate Commission. There shall be an Interstate Commission. The Governor General shall appoint seven, or shall appoint commissioners with terms of seven years. It's in there. It was folded into the Productivity Commission. Now, what I want to know from you, because you know, is does it even exist? What does it do? How much of your time does it take up? if it exists. Now, this is important because there are, people keep pointing to this on both sides of the debate. They, they say, oh, look, um, you can put something in the Constitution, but it doesn't mean it will continue to exist. Some people say that. Other people say, well, you can certainly specify there'll be an institution in the uh, Constitution. Look at it. It's there, and it's part of the Productivity Commission. But I don't want you to opine on that. I want you to tell me, does it exist? And what does it do? Well, no, the <coughs> You're the head of it, right? Yeah. Well, I, I want to check the record on that, Peter, to be honest. The, I mean, our, our remit is defined by our Act. And our Act is the thing that specifies the role and functions of the Productivity Commission, the appointment of commissioners, the way we undertake our work, etc. Um, you know, we, we don't have any hangover from an interstate commission. We, we were... We were the Industry Commission, we had other entities, EPAC and the Bureau of Industry Economics folded into us. 
And, and, and the, the Interstate Commission is folded into the Industry Commission, which yeah, was folded into the PC. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, so basically, the people who say that uh, it's in the Constitution, but that doesn't guarantee its existence, are probably right. Well, I'm not commenting on that, <laughs> Peter, but, you know, as I say, the, you know, our role, um, it's enshrined in an Act of Parliament. It's not really, you know, that we certainly, uh, there's nothing about our everyday role, governance, structures, etc., to which we kind of look to what's in the Constitution. It, it's kind of there embodied in our Act. Mm. Fascinating. Um, Paul Carp. Paul Carp from The Guardian. Uh, could I please ask for your reaction to Coles and Woolworths profits and whether you think that's a sign of a well-functioning market? And do you think that a binding grocery code of conduct with powers to break up the duopoly um, if it's breached, as David Littleprout has advocated, would help suppliers and consumers? So no view on a compulsory code. Uh, I think this ties in with a broader question about competition. Uh, and I think there's an important point here about where we look for sources of competition and how we think it, we might bring it about. So, for example, in retail, in, in groceries, you know, some people have commented on the dominance of two significant players. Um, there are others, but, but Coles and Woolworths have very substantial market share. Now, the truth is we tried to bring out a bit of this dilemma in our report, in the discussion we had about competition. It's easy to look at that aggregate and say, well, we need to break that down. We need more competition. The challenge is, what are the policy tools that are really available to you to do that that mightn't actually have the adverse and unintended consequence of making some consumers worse off, right? Because in many cases, consumers are, feel better off when they've got a Coles or a Woolies because the prices are cheaper, the range is better, etc. cetera. Um, the question or, or you know, how we get more competition in retail and in other sectors it might have some things to do with some general competition framework issues, although our view is that the, the Co Consumer and Competition Act um, and, and other kind of general framework uh, bits of legislation work pretty effectively in Australia. One of the things that has been an inhibitor to competition in, in supermarkets has been planning at the state level, um, because Coles and Woolies pretty well embedded in the planning systems, pretty good at identifying sites, potentially pretty good even at freezing out rivals. When governments, normally state governments, have worried about that and they've wanted to bring in a bit of competition, bring in a Costco, bring in a Kaufland, that didn't happen, but it was mooted, often governments have taken a very proactive stance about allowing or helping, holding the hands, if you like, of the inbound investor to navigate the planning system, um, identify sites, understand the rules, work with councils, work with the, the relevant tribunal, etc. And it's just an indication that sometimes uh, it, it's, the, it's the lever that you don't expect. It's, it's something, it's some other aspect of our general regulatory setup that might be the thing that's the constraint on competition. Uh, and I would be looking to those sorts of things uh, first before getting into the kind of compulsory codes and whatnot. Brendan Howe. <coughs> Hi, Mr. Brennan. Thanks for your speech. Brandon Howe from innovationoz.com. Uh, in your speech, you touched on, again, uh, the need to enhance innovation diffusion across the economy. Uh, I guess one of the factors leading into that is ensuring we have robust supply chains to ensure that the technologies that need to be adopted uh, are available uh, to Australian companies. Uh, the Productivity Commission is generally opposed to interventionist um, industry policy. Um, what, what do you think is, would be the best way for technologies uh, to be made readily available for Australian firms. And I suppose, just on that, um, given interventionist industry policy is growing more popular around the world in, in the US and in the EU, uh, why shouldn't Australia start considering it more? Mm. Well, I think Australia is considering it more. Uh, but the, I think the question on that is not... Uh, it's effectively to avoid the extremes of either having your head in the sand or losing your head altogether. The world has changed, there's no question. Uh, it, there's a few big forces, three that I can think of. Uh, there is concern over supply chain issues and, and, and the security of supply chains, largely post-COVID, but a bit before. Um, there's the need to decarbonise the economy in a relatively short space of time. That's a very dramatic economic change. And there's no question there's been a very discernible policy shift, most notably by the United States, 
evidenced by the Inflation Reduction Act. That is a very protectionist bit of legislation. It, is, it goes to a fundamental transformation, potentially, of the American economy, and the Europeans, to an extent, will follow suit. So the question isn't, you know, should we kind of uh, stick to a doctrinaire line that says, no, never, ever. It's not that at all. It's really just having a hard-headed assessment about what is, you know, and hyper-rational assessment about what is it that Australia ought to be doing in light of that. How does Australia maximise the opportunities, minimise the threats? Um, and we're just a contributor to that debate. I think it's very important that there be a thoughtful and considered debate about those things. My concerns about industry policy are not, you know, that, that you should never ever do it or, or whatever. It, it, it's just a handful of sort of cautionary things, some of which I've, I've mentioned publicly. I mean, one is that uh, I think there is a tendency in the industry policy debate to say, uh, we get that it's been problematic in the past, but this time is different. And I, and I think you have to be a little bit careful about that. Thing two, as I flagged uh, earlier in the week and, and it was reported in the AFR, there is a bit of a tendency in the industry policy debate to grab hold of the most exciting new venture, the most exciting new sector that's on the horizon. Often that's the very sector where the real price, that bit of the value chain, the real price is about to fall dramatically. That's been the experience with, you know, um, computer hardware, et cetera. Um, it's not always clear that it's a really good bet for, for a country to adopt, unless you're going to be the very best at it. The third thing is that I think we conceptualise the economy a bit wrongly when we just think about the fiscal dollars that we want to put into industry policy or the size of this or that fund. Just think of the economy from the supply side. The economy is a bundle of resources. It's people, uh, it's technological know-how, it's capital, it's materials, etc. If you say you, you want more of something, you want to create a new industry, you think we need to be more active in you know, this over here, you've got to remember that, for example, the people who are going to work in that sector, um, they're already doing something. And you've got to be absolutely sure that this is a higher value use of their labour than whatever it is that they're doing. And to some extent, I think it behoves the advocates to say, well, what is it that you want us to be doing less of? What are the industries that should shrink? Um, I, I look at it and I think you know, that it, it is right that we have a debate, it's right that we think very hard about what the IRA means for us. I find it difficult to come to the conclusion that the main logical and rational response to the IRA going on in the United States is that Australia should have a higher relative share of its economy in manufacturing. That just doesn't seem to compute to me. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't mechanisms or, or instances where early stage minerals processing, etc., uh, where a bit of proactive industry policy um, can't help. Thank you. I'm going to squash in a few more questions. I hope Tim Shaw. Thank you, Laura. Tim Shaw, director of the Press Club. Uh, it appears the Productivity Commission was asked by government back in 2013 to comment about um, the regulators' uh, role with small business. 41% of Australians work in small business. Their cost of operation have gone sky high. Many nearly collapsed during the COVID period. Um, can you update us on what role, particularly with you as Commissioner, you've engaged in regard to small business? And if it hasn't been since 2013, what should the Commission be doing to re-engage with small business, particularly in light of the new Albanese government selection? So we engage with small business quite a lot. We, we, it's a while since we've had a terms of reference that specifically go to small business, but pretty much all of our work has us dealing with small business. There's always going to be a small business angle, the productivity uh, inquiry, for example. Mm. Um, in many ways, that's the sort of underpinning or motivation of the observation I made about innovation. Um, most of our small, medium enterprises are not going to be using the R&D tax incentive to invent the next big thing, but, mm. but they can gain in productivity through efficient diffusion of technologies, business innovations, that sort of thing. Look, I think that the challenge on regulation is um, it, it's, it's always there because businesses will complain about compliance burden. and Over-regulation. Over-regulation, and it's real. Um, the, the challenge has always been, as anybody who's ever under, undertaken or overseen a red tape reduction process, business is better at complaining about reg, uh, burden in the abstract than they are at identifying the specific regulations that they think could be eased. 
I think technology is a game changer. And I, I do, I come back to tax reform. You remember in 2000, one of the biggest issues about the introduction of the GST was the business activity statement and the headache of, you know, the small business person, you know, sitting at the kitchen table filling out the forms. Um, tax compliance has been revolutionised, right, by digital technology and the fact that you've got your MYOBs, the zeros, you know, interfacing with the ATO system. Um, actually providing good information back to the business owner. Mm. And I think that's a model of the sort of role that technology could play, both in easing compliance burden, but also effectively helping to diffuse good practice across the economy. Thank you. Nick Stewart. <clears throat> Your reports about closing the gap. Uh, one, one of the key issues is First Nations people have different concepts of disability. They see the answer as being very community driven in terms of dealing with disability issues. How, how do you feel about that? How does the PC manage to incorporate that in the report? Well, I think it's a good example of what I referred to earlier about thinking differently and something Romley's uh, kind of uh, admonished um, among us that we, we potentially have to think about evidence a bit differently. We have to think about the feedback that we get from stakeholders a bit differently. Sometimes uh, we might go into a, an engagement or consultation with a particular set of assumptions. It may not be the way uh, other parties think about it. So, look, I think that is, that's part of the point that I, I make about the, the capability development that we've required and continue to require as a productivity commission when we're working in that space. John Keir. Thanks, Michael, for your speech. Um, I think we can all agree that competition would be good for productivity, lowering prices, that sort of thing. Um, the government's announced competition policy framework changes potentially today. The ACCC has been pushing to make it tougher for big companies to merge and corporate consolidation. The, the shifting the dial report's a little bit more circumspect, specifically on toughening up the merger laws, pointing that mergers can actually help clean up inefficient, unproductive companies. Um, could you just elaborate a little bit around the PC's thinking specifically around those merger sort of issues as, as the government and ACCC ponder this? Sure. And I think, John, by shifting the dial, you mean advancing prosperity. You, ah, you've got absolutely. To get the, get yes. The <laughs> Five years too, uh, too late. Yeah. No, shifting the dial is probably circumspect <laughs> too. So it's, it's absolutely right what you say. The, um, and this is not to be critical of what is proposed in respect of, of mergers. I think there is potential worthwhile reform there. Stephen King, one of our commissioners, um, has, has a, a vast knowledge of these sorts of things. And, you know, I think he's pretty, pretty positive about some of the things that are being talked about. I guess the issue is, it's exactly as you say, there, there's a dilemma in these things, right? Um, a merger can, on the one hand, lessen competition, and that could create concentration, which could go to kind of, you know, hampering that diffusion of good ideas across the economy. Maybe there's less innovation once you've got a whole lot of dominant players. Equally, um, you don't want to artificially prolong the life of an underperforming firm if the, you know, that's not going to be good for productivity if you're standing in the way of a whole lot of resources potentially flowing to a more productive use. So I think it just, you know, our CCA tries to grapple with that reality. I think you can tweak it. I think you can continue to kind of make sure that those trade-offs are being thought about hard. Um, but it does... It, it does defy an easy answer. It's not like, you know, you, you, you know we, we should sort of crack down heavily on every possible merger because there will be mergers that are productivity enhancing and, that, and that's the point we make. There's a similar point about the role of um, large entities, including um, large tech companies, that want to, you know, engage in a bit of horizontal expansion, right, get into a new business. Well, again, on the one hand, are we worried about the behemoths and, and how big they get? Well, maybe. Um, but what if in a economy like Australia, that's the source of competition that, that we can get. Uh, so I think in all of these cases, they're trade-offs, they're at the margin, um, and, and they're not necessarily simple answers. Um, on that note, we'll have to wrap up, but um, please thank Michael Brennan for his time today.